Welcome to episode 408 of the Selling Your Screenplay podcast. I'm Ashley Scott Myers, screenwriter and blogger with SellingYourScreenplay.com. Today I am interviewing writer-director Spencer King, who just did a really cool feature thriller called Time. Now, we talked through this film as well as his first feature film, a film called Black Petunia, and how he's been able to get these films produced. So stay tuned for that interview. If you find this episode valuable, please help me out by giving me a review in iTunes or leaving a comment on YouTube or retweeting the podcast on Twitter or liking or sharing it on Facebook. These social media shares really do help spread word about the podcast, so they're very much appreciated. Any websites or links that I mentioned in the podcast can be found on my blog in the show notes. I also publish a transcript with every episode in case you'd rather read the show or look at something later on. You can find all the podcast show notes at www.sellingyourscreenplay.com slash podcast and then just look for episode number 408. If you want my free guide, How to Sell a Screenplay in Five Weeks, you can pick that up by going to sellingyourscreenplay.com slash guide. It's completely free. Just put in your email address and I'll send you a new lesson once per week for five weeks along with a bunch of bonus lessons. I teach the whole process of how to sell your screenplay in that guide. I'll teach you how to write a professional log line and query letter and how to find agents, managers, and producers who are looking for material. Really is everything you need to know to sell your screenplay. Just go to sellingyourscreenplay.com slash guide. So a quick few words about what I'm working on. So we got another film festival acceptance with the Rideshare Killer, but of course they're not actually screening any films, supposedly because of COVID. Um, so like a lot of the other festivals, it was sort of a waste. I suspect what these online festivals are doing is basically accepting every single film so that filmmakers feel they got something for their money. But the film festival industry has really just deteriorated into a bunch of scammy festivals that don't even really try and offer much value to filmmakers. Um, so really, I'd say the festivals have been a bis- bit, bit of a disappointment for us with the rideshare killer. And again, I do acknowledge the fact that COVID has made things more difficult. But at the same time, the good festivals are running actual in-person events, while the crappier low-end festivals just seem to use it as an excuse. Even here in Los Angeles, movie theaters have been open for months. So there really is no excuse to say you're running, going to run a film festival and then on the other hand say you can't do any screenings because of COVID. I've mentioned this before and I'm starting to really look into this. I'm going to run my own festival next year and hopefully put on an event that actually does build community around independent film and also does give some real value to filmmakers, which is what festivals were supposed to be all about. So hopefully my festival can kind of carry on that tradition. Anyways, that's my rant for the day. We're moving along otherwise with the ride chair killer. We're still working on all the deliverables. Um, We got the final credits finalized this week. That was nice. Um, Mostly what we're doing now is waiting for the poster and we're going to do the final output of the movie here, as I said, hopefully in the next week um, when my editor has some time. There's just some technical things. We've got to put the distributor's logo at the front of the movie and and then there's a specific format that they want the film delivered in, ProRes 422, or they have a whole basically a criteria of exactly what you have to do and you know there's different sound versions we have the um the 5.1 audio you know the regular stereo audio so you just need to output all of these these different versions of the film so you have them for the different places that potentially are going to show your movie um so we've got to work through that stuff but we are making some progress i'm excited to see the poster i haven't heard from those guys this week um but hopefully they're still working away and we'll have something here in the next couple weeks i'm excited to share the poster with the world get it out there um that's you know as i said it's it's kind of part of the the fun part of the process is kind of seeing everything come together and um you know the poster is definitely like a cool piece of that anyway those are the main things that i have been working on so now let's get into the main segment. Today I am interviewing writer director Spencer King, and I apologize in advance. The quality of this audio wasn't great, um, but I thought it was an interesting interview. So um, please just bear with it a little bit, um, and and hopefully you'll get some good information out of it. Anyway, here is the interview. Welcome, Spencer, to the Selling Your Screenplay podcast. I really appreciate you coming on the show with me today. Thanks for having me. So to start out, maybe you can tell us a little bit about your background. Where did you grow up and how did you get interested in the entertainment business? Well, I grew up in L.A., so I was surrounded by the entertainment industry. And uh, mm-hmm. I was, it started, I was a, I would write short films of my own and just stories and stuff like that. And then I'd make projects with my friends. And then when I moved to Michigan, um, when I was in college, is when I really started making films. And I lived there for about five years, and that's where I eventually wrote and directed Time Now. 
Okay, gotcha, gotcha. So it looks like on IMDb, you did a movie in 2016 called Black Petunia. Maybe you can talk about that quickly. How did you get that one produced? Um, and, and how did that ultimately lead to, to Time Now? Well, it led directly to Time Now. That was, I was actually, I was 18 years old when I directed that movie. That was just a, that was just me and a bunch of friends and we came together and we really, it was like a crash course in film school, basically. Um, I didn't go to film school, so I, I really think I learned um, I learned the ebbs and flows of making a film through that project. And we, um, a lot of the people that worked on Time Now were a part of that project as well. So that that was really the catalyst to eventually leading to Time Now. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay, so let's talk about maybe some of those folks that you were involved with with Black Petunia, and um, how did you kind of get in with all of those those people originally? Yeah, well, it started, there was a woman named Crystal Starr, who I think is, I'm, I'm happy that you asked me about that, because she is a, she is an amazing um, collaborator with me, and she really helped that project get off the ground, and she actually wasn't a part of this final project in time now, but we still are in touch, and I, I thank her all the time, she's in the special thanks in that, um, because she, uh, she really is someone I respect, and she really was like the first person in Detroit that was like, Oh, you, uh, I want to, want to help you do what you want to do. So she was a, she was a big part of that. And then, um, yeah. And then Josh Cadre, who's an associate producer, um, he, he composed, uh, Black Petunia and he is one of the people that I send, one of my best friends. He's one of the people I send every, every draft of every script I write to. So I have a lot of people that are, gotcha. yeah. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay, so let's dig into time now a little bit. Maybe to start out, you can just give us a quick pitch or a log line. What is this film all about? It's about a woman returning to her hometown of Detroit where after her brother dies and she's reconnecting with her estranged family who she has really cut ties with. She's trying to figure out who her brother became as a person and an artist in the city of Detroit and reconnect with her family. And, uh, and she starts to realize that his death might not be quite what it seems. And where did this idea come from? What was the genesis of the story? You know, it started in just being in the art scene and being in that culture, around that culture, and uh, and wanting to do something that was grounded in the city. And then there was a, I had some inspiration about a character, Jenny, and a character, Cash, who is uh, who are the two main characters in this film. And um, the film, the script took a million different twists and turns over the four years that I was working on it, but that's where it started. It was just the city of Detroit inspiring us. So as you were developing this project, what was sort of your goals? Like what, what were you trying to accomplish with it? And I'm talking about, you know, artistically and professionally. Yeah, it's a good question. I was trying to make something that was visceral, that was emotional, that, uh, that was, that the audience could put themselves in a couple of these characters' shoes and understand that, you know, the process of grieving that all these characters are going through. And that's something that I've always, I've always uh, been stumped on. The concept of grief has, you know, it's, it's for a long time, it's just, it, it, it blows my mind how, it doesn't blow my mind, but it's just, it's very fascinating how we all deal with it. And that's really what this film is about. Gotcha. Gotcha. So let's talk about your writing process a little bit. Um, where do you typically write and when do you typically write? Um, do you have like a home office? Do you need to go to Starbucks and hear the ambient noise? What does that look like for you? No, I don't. I cannot write in front of anyone else. I, I need to be, I need to be like on my couch with a full surround sound of film score playing. And, um, huh. <laughs> for location wise, I writing to me always starts with characters. I'm not really a plot writer. And, um, that's something that I want to work on more is writing for plot. But for me, it always starts with characters and it usually, and usually ends with characters too. I, I feel like most of the stuff I write is a character study. Gotcha. Gotcha. So what is your, um, how much time do you spend doing the outline and how much time do you spend in final draft actually cranking out script pages? Um, I spend a lot of time in final draft. I usually, I try to avoid final draft but it, it just always comes calling my name. And I, as I try and spend time prepping, but I just wind up in final draft. So I'm doing, you know, I'm, 
I try and be organized, but a lot of it, a lot of it just has to be flushed through for me. A lot of times I just need to get it out and then I need to look mm-hmm. back at it with a, uh, with a more sober head. Um, and, uh, yeah, and go from there. Gotcha. Gotcha. So just talk a little bit about your development process. It sounds like you have um, a producer that you trust. And so you get notes um, from that person. Um, but just how do you get your, once you have a draft that you're done, um, what does that look like? Do you have a few people and, and how do you handle those notes? If you get notes that you don't necessarily agree with, how do you handle those? And um, if you get notes from people, from two different people that are maybe opposing notes, how do you kind of work through that? Yeah, well, Zion Hamill, the producer on this, he was very involved in the script in this, and he, uh, he, you know, he would tell me stuff that I disagreed with, and I had to, you know, and it's hard to take your ego out of things sometimes, you know, and that's something I dealt with for a long time on this, is, you know, you, you say something that's in contradiction, someone says something in contradiction to how you feel, and, you know, you, you get a little angry and defensive, and then sometimes you sleep on it, and you're like, man, they're right, actually, so... It's important to have an open mind and uh, understand that um, someone critiquing you is, you know, if, if someone doing that, it means they care about what you're, what you're working on. So, you know, it's, mm-hmm. it's, it's honestly, when you look at it that way, it's a compliment, but sometimes hard in the moment to do things that way. So once you were done with the script, what were some of these next steps? It sounds like maybe your producer was already involved in the development of the script. Did he have funding lined up? Um, what, what did you guys do then to kind of get this thing from script actually into production? Well, if we didn't end up filming it, well, I would still be working on the script. I was working on this script up until literally the last day of the shoot. Um, I'm always, it's, it's impossible for me to put anything down. You know, once we had a once we had a script that we were sent that we were good with, like you know, we had a script that we that we took out to financiers and we um, and it was script and a lookbook. So that's what we did is we we went script lookbook, get financing from there. Gotcha, gotcha. Um, so what's next for you? Are you working on something else? Um, do you have other projects in the pipeline? Yeah, well, I have my next film that uh, that will. I'm not yet in pre-production, but I will be going into pre-production soon. I hope so. Gotcha. How, how can people see time now? Do you know what the release schedule is going to be like? Yeah, well, it's on it's on video on demand right now, and we can you can get it on iTunes and Amazon and all those all the streaming all the for purchase video on demand places, and then we're hoping to do a theater release and. New York, LA, and Detroit, and then hopefully get it on a streamer by 2022. But right now, video on demand, you can grab it on there. Okay, perfect, perfect. Is there anything you've seen recently that you thought was really great? Anything on Netflix, Hulu, HBO, um, that you thought was really great and might be useful for screenwriters to take a look at? Yeah, so it's not out yet, but I just saw it at the Austin Film Festival, which we just premiered our film at it, but the worst person in the world. It's a, uh, it's a Danish movie, and it will be coming out very soon. It was, it was the best movie I've seen in a long time. I haven't had to see it. Oh, and what was, the, what was the title again? The Worst Person in the World. The Worst Person in the World. Gotcha. So, perfect. Yeah, we'll keep an eye out for that. What's the best way for people to keep up with what you're doing? Um, Twitter, Facebook, a blog, Instagram, anything you're comfortable sharing, I will round up for the show notes. Um, I mean, welcome to follow me on Instagram, Spencer E. King. Uh, no spaces or anything. Um, I often post little stuff about the film, but the time now does not have its own social media accounts and stuff like that. So um, follow me, get some updates from there. Gotcha, gotcha. Well, Spencer, I really appreciate you coming on and taking a few minutes to talk with me. Good luck with this film and good luck with all your future projects as well. Thank you so much, Ashley. Have a good one. You too. We'll talk to you later. Bye. Bye. A quick plug for the SYS Screenwriting Analysis Service. It's a really economical way to get a high quality professional evaluation on your screenplay. When you buy our three pack, you get evaluations at just $67 per script for feature films and just $55 for teleplays. All the readers have professional experience reading for studios, production companies, contests, and agencies. You can read a short bio on each reader on our website, and you can pick the reader who you think is the best fit for your script. 
Turnaround time is usually just a few days, but rarely more than a week. The readers will evaluate your script on six key factors, concept, character, structure, marketability, tone, and overall craft, which includes formatting, spelling, and grammar. Every script will get a grade of pass, consider, or recommend, which should help you roughly understand where your script might rank if you were to submit it to a production company or agency. We can provide an analysis on features or television scripts. We also do proofreading without any analysis. We will also look at a treatment or outline and give you the same analysis on it. So if you're looking to vet some of your project ideas, this is a great way to do it. We will also write your logline and synopsis for you. You can add this logline and synopsis writing service to an analysis, or you can simply purchase this service as a standalone product. As a bonus, if your screenplay gets a recommend or a consider from one of our readers, you get to list the screenplay in the SYS Select database, which is a database for producers to find screenplays and a big part of our SYS Select program. Producers are in the database searching for material on a daily basis. So it's another great way to get your material in front of them. As a further bonus, if your script gets a recommend from one of our readers, your screenplay will get included in our monthly best of newsletter. Each month we send out a newsletter that highlights the best screenplays that have come through our script analysis service. This is monthly newsletter that goes out to our list of over 400 producers who are actively looking for material. So again, this is another great way to get your material out there. So if you want a professional evaluation of your screenplay at a very reasonable price, check out www.sellingyourscreenplay.com slash consultants. Again, that's sellingyourscreenplay.com slash consultants. On the next episode of the podcast, I'm going to be interviewing screenwriter Jamie Nash. He is a writer who has made a career out of working far from Hollywood. He actually lives in Maryland, where I'm originally from. He talks about how he was able to break into the business all while working a regular job as a computer programmer, again, while living in Maryland. He also wrote the TV version of Blake Snyder's Save the Cat. So we talk about that book as well, and we do get into some TV writing. It's another just inspiring story. Again, a guy didn't have connections, didn't live in Hollywood, but has been able to make a career for himself living, for living far from Hollywood. So keep an eye out for that episode next week. That's our show. Thank you for listening.